Okay, so hopefully we've had a fairly light and brief introduction to some of the ideas behind gauge theories. Now I should be able to talk about edge modes. So as I mentioned in the first video, the full title of this project was Boundary Conditions and Edge Modes. And I wanted to make it clear that in this, in this context, the edge modes are boundary conditions. They are the same thing. So <clears throat> this theory, or this project essentially looked at what happens when you introduce a boundary? A lot of bad things happen, but hopefully these bad things can be compensated for by boundary conditions or edge modes. So as I mentioned before, we usually deal with theories that either we approximate that there's no boundary or we're kind of assuming that we're far enough away from any boundary that could exist that we're not going to feel any effects that the boundary is going to introduce. Now, obviously, this is a simplification. We do have boundaries in our physical theories. So, for example, the first place in which edge modes are really found to be needed was in electromagnetism, where essentially if you have some conductor that has some kind of edge, the blobby part is the rest of our conductor, but when we get near to this edge, we stop being inside the conductor and we're in a vacuum, say. So you can happily apply Maxwell's electromagnetism in the majority of this conductor. So in the bulk, in the bulk, electromagnetism is fine. We're far enough away from this boundary that nothing goes wrong. However, when you get close to this boundary, electromagnetism is going to start breaking down and essentially you're going to be finding bad things like non-conservation of current along the boundary. And this is Kind of obvious why this should be the case because essentially on one side of the boundary we have conductor so this might be some region that has free conducting electrons or whatever but when we reach this other side we have essentially no charge so we're going to have some kind of discontinuity across this boundary in the current or charge density and so standard electromagnetism doesn't say anything about this, it doesn't incorporate this into the theory. We need to introduce something new to the theory. And essentially, this was identified as the first case where we needed to add something on the boundary. And it was found that you need to add essentially an extra current on the boundary. So this would be now the edge current. You need this edge current in order to maintain overall charge conservation. So this is obviously just a schematic picture, I haven't gone through the full details of the electromagnetism, but hopefully the idea is clear. Standard theories that don't know about boundaries, when we introduce a physical boundary, obviously the, the physics at the boundary is going to be different than in the bulk by virtue of this kind of discontinuity across the boundary. And to compensate for this, we need to add something new to the theory, which is an edge mode. So that was the kind of first place when we realised we needed edge modes, which was in classical electromagnetism. More generally, however, it was found that we need these edge modes in gauge theories that have a boundary. OK, so in the gauge theory case, something very similar happens to in the electromagnetism case. If we, for example, have some space-time, and now I'm drawing my space-time already separated into two regions, the whole space-time, which I'm going to call M, consists of these two blocks, which I've already chopped in half and introduced a boundary to. So this left side I'll call sigma, and this one can be sigma hat, or bar rather. So all I've done so far is just drawn a space-time and chopped it in half. I've introduced what's known as a fiducial boundary. This boundary is going to disappear when I glue these two regions back together. It could be the case that there is no other half to this space-time. This could be a physical boundary, but I'm not going to distinguish between those two cases for now. So if we have some, now, a gauge theory defined on this space-time, the whole space-time, right here but the whole space-time is the union of these two 
two regions. So a gauge theory that we define on this space-time. Of course, we're going to have our gauge fields that live on the space-time. So what does introducing this boundary do to our gauge theory? Well, first of all, we should remember or realise that we always need things to be gauge invariant. And now, without going into the details, introducing a boundary like this is going to break gauge invariance in most cases. Not necessarily the case, but even if introducing a boundary doesn't break overall gauge invariance, you can break other things to do with presymplectic forms not being gauge invariant, but that's all details we're not going to need. We, we can just content ourselves with the motivation that introducing a boundary is going to break gauge invariance. And so we need some way to kind of restore gauge invariance, even if we have boundary. So first of all, I'm just going to draw something on this figure which kind of represents gauge invariance. So what I've drawn here is known as a Wilson line. This is essentially, now this is getting a bit technical, but around this loop, this is a closed loop in the space-time, we can define what's known as the holonomy around this loop. So don't worry if you don't know what that means, it's just, essentially it's a, a quantity which is defined by first defining a loop, and then evaluating something to do with the gauge fields around this loop. And the holonomy is going to be related to uh, the curvature or the, the field strength of the gauge fields. Again, this is all terminology you don't need to know. But what we like is that we can draw these Wilson loops and essentially they represent gauge invariant quantities. So if I draw a few more of these Wilson loops on, any Wilson loop I draw, I need to be able to fully evaluate the gauge field around such a loop. Now, what happens if I draw a loop which crosses over the boundary like this? Well, I can evaluate the holonomy around this half and the other half. And what's going to happen across the boundary? Well, they need to kind of agree in some way. So what can we do this in practice? Obviously, it's just a schematic. But essentially, what we need to do is we need to have some, some thing or some kind of extra object on the boundary where the Wilson line can kind of end or in this case two ends be joined together essentially these now yellow blobs which I've drawn are the representation of edge modes in this gauge theory kind of picture now this is all a picture don't take any of this too literally and the, the kind of perspective with Wilson lines isn't really what we use Generally, it's just a kind of nice, nice way to visualise this. I've just drawn this picture because I think it's easy to visualise. Essentially, what needs to happen is that wherever a boundary occurs, things need to match up on the boundary. That's what the edge mode is going to do for us. So these yellow blobs are the edge modes. And as I mentioned, edge modes are the same thing as boundary conditions. So what, what's happening at the yellow blob is an extra piece of information has been specified that essentially ensures the boundary condition that this gauge that this thing is a gauge invariant loop. So the edge modes, the yellow blobs, are going to be ensuring the boundary condition. Now, what is the boundary condition? Well, essentially it's that we want to maintain gauge invariance of this loop. So the boundary condition in this context would be saying that the gauge field when it meets this boundary here is the same as the gauge field over here. And now how do we ask the question, are two gauge fields the same? Well, hopefully from the last video you'll remember we need a gauge transformation to kind of see that they're the same because we couldn't use the equals sign, we had to use the gauge transformation. So this edge mode we should now realize is a gauge transformation on the boundary. So to shorten here that's transformation, that's boundary. So the edge modes, the yellow blobs, are gauge transformations on the boundary only. And now what these gauge transformations essentially do for us is they say that well any gauge field on the boundary, well it has to be equivalent to its corresponding gauge field over here. Okay, so I'll just state that again. Essentially, 
In order to maintain the gauge variance, we have to know that the gauge field here and here, they are the same gauge field in a sense. And the way that we ask our two gauge fields the same is we define a gauge transformation. So obviously this is just a schematic. This isn't how we do things in practice. In practice, we would define rather use something that's called the homotopy pullback, which is kind of a bit of new machinery that my supervisor has kind of worked on introducing into edge modes. And essentially it gives a really, really nice way to construct these edge modes using kind of topological arguments. Essentially you say that the bulk groupoid of all the gauge fields has to essentially be the same for gauge equivalent to the boundary groupoid gauge fields. And you realize this equivalence by, well, technically it's done by forming a homotopy pullback. I'm not going to go through the details of that, but using this homotopy pullback construction essentially allows you to automatically identify these edge modes. Previously, you would just kind of add them in by hand in order to kind of fix the gauge invariance. You kind of know they need to be there, so you just add them. Whereas when you do the construction using the homotopy pullback, it makes everything much more natural and arguably more elegant. So I'll just now summarize then. Essentially, we've realized that when we introduce a boundary, potentially bad things can happen. Gauge invariants can be broken. And first of all, we need to know what happens to our gauge fields on the boundary. Even if gauge invariance isn't broken, we still, we still need to know what the gauge field is on the boundary. And essentially, this is done by introducing these edge modes, which essentially are the realization that the gauge field from the, the bulk, when we restrict it to the boundary, they are the same gauge field on the boundary. Now we realize that the way edge modes can do this is the fact that, well, edge modes are able to do this because they are gauge transformations. They are essentially allowed to ask the question, is one gauge field the same as another gauge field? So essentially the edge mode is the gauge transformation which witnesses or realizes that the, the bulk gauge field that comes from bulk is the same as the gauge field that we've defined on the boundary. Thank <laughs> you.